to begin with this sketch, which I drew a few weeks, maybe a month after the attack, brings me back to, to that day in uh, 2001. In fact, when I walked in the building today, I noticed the address on Broad Street. It reminded me of that day because my wife used to work at the very other end of Broad Street, at 125, and she was already at work that morning. And I uh, remember seeing the attacks from the rooftop of our apartment building in the East Village. Um, and then rushing down here to find her walking north on uh, Water Street as the first tower fell down. So as a New Yorker, and I think many people in this room are New Yorkers and remember that day very clearly, I felt compelled to, to try and respond in some way to, to the emotions that I felt. And uh, as a designer, I began to sketch. And I imagined, for some reason, um, the sort of image that came in a dream, two voids in the Hudson River, uh, as if the river had been split open, torn open, forming these two square voids, and the water would cascade down into them, never filling them up, the sense of ongoing absence. Um, and I was so intrigued by this idea that I ended up spending the next year in my free time taking this sketch and developing a small fountain, a small sculpture that captured that idea of that surface of water sort of shorn open, forming these two square voids. And I ended up taking it up to that rooftop in the East Village and photographing it against the Manhattan skyline. And I could see the absence of the towers and the skyline mirrored and reflected in the foreground in these two voids. And today we're talking about filling the void. I don't know that this was an attempt to fill the void as much as to acknowledge it, to relate to it, to, to, to accept it in some way. And when I finished doing this, I kind of took this model and set it aside and thought that I had kind of finished this uh, self-directed cathartic exercise. But a year later, um, a competition was announced for the design of the memorial at the World Trade Center. And it followed the selection of a master plan by Daniel Liebskin, which took that super block that had been created in the 60s and carved it up into four unequal city blocks by bringing Greenwich Street back through the site, as well as Fulton, setting aside an eight acre site where the towers had once been as the site for the memorial. And I thought that that was a very positive uh, move. I thought that connecting the site back to the city was important. And in no small part because of my own experiences in New York in the days and weeks that followed the attack. I think the way that New York responded to the attack, the way New Yorkers did, with a tremendous amount of stoicism and compassion and determination, was in no small part the product of our ability to stand side by side with fellow New Yorkers at street corners or at public squares and that these public spaces had a civic virtue within them that allowed us to literally stand together um, and respond as a community. And for the first time in my life, having lived in New York for a number of years, I felt like a New Yorker. Um, it was kind of a strange that it had to take that to bring me to that realization. And so when I saw these plans for, uh, for the site that were issued as part of the competition guidelines, I felt that although the master plan tried to integrate the site overall back into the life of the city, the site of the memorial itself was cut off from the life of the city. There was a large bridge building over the North Tower footprint, which you see in a lighter green on the left side of the screen. And there was um, a long ramp, which would bring you down from street level into this very big pit in the middle of the city. And I could understand the desire to shield and separate the site from the everyday life of the city, but my own experience in New York taught me how resilient public space was and how important it was to actually bring these different uses together, to imagine a place that would be a memorial, but also a living part of the day-to-day -day life of New York. And so, in a very polemical way, I sent, started to develop an idea which ignored these guidelines and suggested bringing everything up to grade, creating a memorial plaza bounded by West Street in Greenwich, by Fulton and Liberty, and then taking these voids, which I had previously thought of as markers in the river and bringing them to the site to mark the footprints of the towers. This was the competition entry I sent in. This was before digital submissions were common. So I literally sent a 30 by 40 inch board um, to the LMDC. And on this board, I described these ideas. And the last few words on the text above are work or play. I thought it was very important to say that this is a site for memory, but it's also a site where people who will be working in these office towers around this plaza should be able to come down at lunch, where people who live in this neighborhood with their kids should come 
and, and be able to spend a beautiful afternoon or day together. And th this wasn't a zero-sum game, that in fact, having all of these different groups together on the site enriched and made more meaningful the experience of being at the site for whatever reason you are here, whether it was for that once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage or whether it was because you, know, you wanted to take a lunch break with a friend and then go back up to work. So in a nutshell, I think these two simple ideas, this notion of making absence visible and tangible and the notion of creating a public space were at the very heart of this memorial design. And as you can see, it changed in some ways over this period of eight years from design through construction. But I think those ideas remain true. Um, but what looks like a very simple plaza in the middle of the city is in fact quite a complicated uh, structure. It's a green roof above 60 feet of program space and below us is everything from a train to New Jersey, a subway running under Greenwich Street, uh, pump rooms for the fountains, a museum, an underground concourse linking the Fulton Street Transit Center to, to the World Financial Center. But up above, what it feels like is a normal public space. And we didn't want to telegraph that complexity up. What we really wanted to do was allow the site to communicate absence, which is a quality that is rare in New York. We're f New York is full of stuff, and to actually leave a space empty is rare. And it's not empty and devoid of meaning. It's an emptiness that is analogous to the silence of, uh, of a moment of silence. What you do with that moment of silence, where you take it, is up to you. But we have given people the opportunity to have that, that moment of introspection. I'd like to segue to, to a corollary to this, which is my thought about design. Um, we were guided by these ideas, by this notion of making absence visible, of being able to look to the past. But design itself is a process. And when we began this process, there were many things which are unknown to us. It's not just the end product. It's how you get there. And one of the most critical things in the design of the memorial was how would we arrange the names of the victims? And there was no simple answer. An alphabetical listing wouldn't have worked. It would have put together some people that, whose names didn't really belong together, and it would have separated other people whose names should have been side by side. Um, it would have drawn no distinction between some people that share the same name, and we have quite a few of those on this memorial. And so I suggested something as I got into this process, which I called meaningful adjacency, that there would be a reason why one name is next to another. And it would have to do with the meaning that that adjacency would have for family members. They would be able to request that a certain name be next to the name of the person that they lost. If there was one item above all else which, which the family members cared about, it was this. And when I initially suggested that, that idea was seen as too complicated to implement. Um, and the LMDC felt very apprehensive about it. And so for two years, that idea had to be set aside, and uh, the names were arranged uh, randomly, reflecting the haphazard brutality of that day. But they also, that idea disappointed and angered many family members, and it brought fundraising for the memorial to a complete and total standstill. And it wasn't until Mayor Bloomberg became chairman of the Memorial Foundation in 2006 that uh, we had the opportunity to revisit this issue. And um, the mayor is a very data-driven guy, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, having seen Bloomberg terminals. And he approached this very much like uh, a, a problem that could be addressed by understanding all of the parameters of it. Um, and he spent a lot of time uh, with us, with the design team, trying to figure uh, a solution that would work. Um, and one thing that came out of it was the idea to arrange names into nine broad groups, which reflect where people were that day geographically. The four flights, the two towers in the Pentagon, the 93 bombing victims who all died near the North Tower footprint, and the first responders. And they, in turn, are grouped by where they came from, from the same firehouse, from the same precinct building. But within these groups, and some of these groups have hundreds of names within them, the names are arranged by meaningful adjacency. The mayor gave us the opportunity to test this idea out again. And when letters finally went out to family members in 2009, asking them to verify the spelling of the name of their loved one, um, and to tell us if there are other names that they would like to see next to the person that they lost, we received over 1,200 um, responses back. Um, asking us for this name to be next to that name and for that name to be next to these two names or three names. 
And the nature of these requests was incredibly personal. Um, and we couldn't have imagined some of these requests. We got a request from the family of a young woman whose father passed away that day. He was on Flight 11, and her best friend from college was working for Aeon at the North Tower, where Flight 11 crashed. And we were able to put his name as one of the last names within the Flight 11 group, and her name as one of the first names within the World Trade Center at the North Pool. And that, when this family visits the memorial, it's very meaningful for them to see that. But that meaning can be shared with many other people through various means, whether it's an app on a smartphone, a recording you can listen to, a printed brochure. Once that meaning is embedded in that arrangement, it can be teased out by different means over time. And what I think is very important about that is that it takes this abstraction. Uh, it's not an abstraction, but it almost can feel like an abstraction of close to 3,000 dead. How do you relate to that number? It's very hard to find a window or a door to, 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 to enter into that. And instead, you're hearing about the story of one person, of how the, the losses that were suffered that day impacted that one person, that one family. And you can do that in many different panels on the memorial right now. Um, and I think that that is important. I'd like to end with a few images of the memorial, most of them from the day that it opened, and to say that everything that we did up until that point felt like it was just half of the equation. And the second half was letting the public come in here together to be in the presence of each other. And to me, that goes back to my own experiences in New York of not being alone by going to places like Union Square, Washington Square, and standing in the company of others. What charges this place is not just the past, but how we react to it today. Thank you. Thank you.